sir will be uh, good morning yes good morning yes sir will be starting in 2 minutes because people will be joining yeah yeah sure so uh may, may i know this uh, the participants in the uh, in this discussion today are sir, they no, in the first year or uh, you know much later years of their uh, md and dm training sir we have most of them are uh, sort of students which will be uh, like surgeons it's a mixed crowd so we'll have sort of some sort of radiation oncologists though they will differ every time different people will be joining so uh, we have all sorts of students and training so a very good morning to everyone i dr poonam joshi welcome you all to our another actrac hadnek class series uh today's speaker is dr vikram gota uh, sir is a professor in the department of clinical uh, clinical pharmacology uh, at trek uh, tata meru center mumbai uh, he will be speaking on uh, the various randomized control trials what are they exactly and uh, what we need to learn about them so uh, we welcome you vikram sir please go ahead with the presentation thank you very much uh, dr poonam for this kind invitation uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to students about uh, trial designs um so um i will be talking to you today about uh, randomized controlled trials uh, i hope you can hear me and i hope you can see my screen we can hear you sir and we can see the slides very well okay we total cover randomized controlled trial इंट्रोडक्शन टू स्टडी डिजाइन and then uh, i'll be talking a little bit about uh, the three uh, study designs superiority non inferiority and equivalence i'll discuss their benefits and limitations and uh, step by step methodology for designing them and uh, the statistics behind it you know particularly the uh, uh, estimation of sample size and i'll also uh, take some examples and discuss how uh, the results were interpreted in each uh, context okay uh, so uh, broadly you know when we talk about uh, study designs we can classify any study into observational or experimental and under under observational we have descriptive studies and analytical studies descriptive studies are like case reports case series surveys and so on and so forth where you just say okay uh, i mean you will either describe a patient or you will describe a group of patients and then uh, say that okay five out of 10 had this problem and uh, you know they were treated so you don't come, come to any kind of conclusion but you just state the facts okay on the other hand analytical uh, studies will help you to come to some kind of conclusion so they include uh, uh, or inference rather so they include cross sectional studies case control studies and cohort studies and among the experimental studies you have non randomized trials um, some of the uh, phase 2 clinical trials and phase 1 clinical trials are non randomized in nature and uh, you have randomized controlled trials and within the randomized controlled trials the popular design designs are parallel designs where one group gets a and the other group gets b treatment and you will follow them up and then look at the uh, difference and the other one is crossover so where one group gets a the other group gets b and then uh, you will uh, look for an outcome and after that they will cross over uh, so the arm that was getting a will get b b will get a and then you will uh, further uh, study them so the advantage of a crossover design which is not very common in uh, uh, definitely in oncology but mostly for pharmacokinetics we do this crossover studies and the advantage is, is that the subject will act as his own control because he will be getting both uh, uh, standard and uh, novel intervention he will act as his own control so we can that way 
minimize uh, the intersubject uh, variability that comes into play. So, but anyway, I'll be discussing only about the parallel designs today, which include the non inferiority equivalence and the superiority trials. So now, uh, this definition of randomized control trial is extremely important, and uh, I think you know the keywords uh, that are that are here should not be missed as at least in in uh, conceptualization and uh, having an idea about randomized control trials. So an RCT is defined as a prospective. We all agree it's a prospective study. Comparative because there are two or three treatment arms, A, B, or A, B, C, or whatever. Quantitative study because we are going to quantify quantify the outcomes and the difference between the outcomes. So these are performed under controlled condition. All of us agree once again because there will be certain inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria, and then we are going to kind of mark uh, strict timelines for follow up. Uh, you know, uh, so therefore it is controlled under. Uh, I mean, conducted under controlled conditions with the random allocation. So now, what is the random allocation? So the definition of random allocation is that any patient who is entering into the study should have an equal chance of getting into any of the arms, okay? So like, for example, uh, your patient comes into uh, his uh, screen and he's ready for enrollment. You toss a coin, head will go into treatment A, uh, tail will go into treatment B. That's the simplest way of randomization because, because even that will allow the subject an equal chance of getting into any of the arms. So therefore, if you have a randomization uh, uh, pattern, wherein patients who come on Monday, Wednesday, uh, uh, Friday will be random, randomized to treat arm A, and uh, um, uh, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday will be randomized to arm B. That is not actual randomization because the allocation is not random and it will not allow the subject to get an, a, an equal opportunity of uh, getting randomized to uh, either A or B. So therefore, that random understanding the term random allocation or randomization is very important, okay? Random allocation of interventions to the group being compared so as to minimize bias. So the random allocation is important because you will minimize the bias and establish a cause-effect relationship between intervention and outcome. So then you'll be able to establish whether if I give this uh, treatment A, whether I'll be able to kind of prolong uh, uh, survival or you know uh, prevent disease recurrence or improve the uh, uh, responses or uh, prevent toxicity, whatever. Okay. So as I said. And these are largely done under three uh, banners, which is superiority, inferiority, uh, non inferiority, and uh, equivalence. So, just to put things in context, you no, know, I mean, I'll just uh, tell you you are given a uh, uh, drug, okay, a new antibiotic, and there is an old antibiotic. So, what are the different types of questions that can be raised with this simple issue of new and old antibiotic? So, the three points. Other hypothesis are the new antibiotic is better than the old antibiotic. Okay, the new antibiotic is at least as good as the old antibiotic, and the new antibiotic is equivalent to the old antibiotic. So that that actually describes each of the different trial, trial designs that we are going to adopt. So in the first one, we are going to adopt a superiority trial design. In the second instance, we are going to adopt a non inferiority design, and in the third one, we are going to adopt a equivalent a equivalence design. Okay, so now it is important to pay some attention to the hypothesis of each of these uh, different uh, trial types. Okay, so let us see what is the null hypothesis and the uh, alternate hypothesis of a superiority trial. So when you are doing a superiority trial, the null hypothesis states, the first thing you want to say is there is no difference between the two treatments. Okay, so that is your null hypothesis, though there is no difference between the treatment. So the alternative hypothesis is you have to watch the language here when the no no difference will become there is there is difference okay so the alternative hypothesis there is a difference between the treatments likewise equivalence the null hypothesis is that two treatments are not equivalent and then you are going to reject that and then say that the th therapy, new therapy is equivalent to the current treatment. And in the non inferiority trial, the new therapy is inferior to the current therapy is the null hypothesis. Okay, you say that the new treatment is inferior. You reject that and then say the new treatment is not inferior. Okay, so the new treatment is not inferior to the current treatment. 
So understanding the this language is extremely important. You know, when you're uh, not to kind of kind of conceptualize, uh, you know, either superiority, equivalence, or uh, non-fertile. And you must understand here that actually a simple flipping of the hypothesis will actually, uh, you know, result in a superior trial, uh, superior trial being uh, converted into an equivalence trial. See, there is the null hypothesis of superiority is the research hypothesis of the equivalent trial and vice versa. Okay. So it is very important to understand it. Superiority trial, there is no difference. And then you say there is difference. Equivalent trial, you say they are not equivalent and then show that they are equivalent. non trial, you say that, you know, it is uh, a new treatment is inferior and then you say they show that it is not inferior. Okay. So now, uh, how does it go? I mean, uh, you know, statistically speaking, I mean, uh, when you visualize the outcomes, okay, this is all about visualization. So when you visualize the outcomes of uh, the trials, how is it going to be? So the first instance, so these are the margins. So all equivalence trials will have margin on both sides. Non-inferior trial will have margin only on one side. And superiority trial will not have any margin. And the only thing that is important in the superiority trial is the lower bound of the confidence interval should be on one side. It should be towards one side of the line of no difference. So if this confidence interval is straddling this line of no difference, then you cannot conclude um, significant difference okay so now what is happening the first instance is this is equivalent second instance this is also equivalent okay and the third instance is significantly inferior why because this is a superiority trial okay and then observed treatment difference and the confidence interval is what we are looking at and new treatment worse okay so, uh, the, so on the right hand side is new treatment worse, on the left hand side is new treatment better, and you will see that the lower bound of the new treatment worse is is not crossing zero, which means that new treatment is indeed worse. Okay. In the fourth example, once again superiority trial, and you will find that the, the lower bound of the confidence interval is on the other side of zero, which shows new treatment is better. So therefore, it, this is significantly superior. And then the fifth instance is a non inferiority hypothesis that they were trying to test. And then new treatment worse. So what is the hypothesis in the non inferiority trial? The new treatment may be worse, but it should not be worse beyond a certain margin. So this lower bound of the confidence interval, uh, you know, are you able to see here? This lower bound of the confidence interval, it should be well within this margin. So if that is that happens, you are not worried about the uh, upper bound of the confidence interval. Only the lower bound, if it is within the margin, you can within the margin, you can say you can conclude non inferiority. So this is a no, uh, this uh, uh, this observation supports non inferiority of the new intervention with respect to uh, control or conventional data. Okay, so this is a graphical visualization of how the superiority, non inferiority, and equivalence uh, trials look like so now i will be talking about uh, each of them separately so a brief introduction to superiority trials superiority trials aims to demonstrate the superiority of a new treatment compared to established treatment. and that is mostly the case i mean in the sense you know <laughs> where you want to show that treatment b which is new is better than treatment a and you will start with the hypothesis that treatment a is equal to b and you will reject that and accept that treatment b is better if that is the case okay by now, uh, okay, how much should the new treatment be better? So always we kind of uh, wonder what should be the difference. See, some of the uh, most common questions that I get, uh, you know, whenever I talk about trials is, how much difference is better, okay? So the difference that you choose in a superiority trial is, you know, the difference that is, should be the difference that is clinically meaningful. So you have in the in the, in the past seen instances where people have shown uh, you know on hazard uh, of uh, uh, a, a difference of let's say one month, <laughs> days, one month and so on and so forth and then you know they have employed, you know they have used a huge sample size and then they have showed that you know because you are getting a huge sample size your confidence interval will be very tight and then you can demonstrate uh, significance. So but then. But then one must think whether that difference of 15 days that you have shown in the outcome of, uh, uh, you know, uh, relapse with survival, is it clinically meaningful? 
So therefore, you should always set a, a, a delta which is clinically meaningful. Like for example, I mean, and the you as a, an oncologist will decide what is meaningful. Like for example, if the standard treatment has a recurrence free survival of 12 months, what improvement over that is clinically meaningful? Is 14 months good enough? 15 months good enough? Or should it be 20 months? Or should it be 25 months? Whatever it is, but you are the best judge. So, and based on that, so you will uh, determine the delta. Okay. And this is called the least relevant difference or the clinical significance. Okay. There is a least relevant. So, anything below that is not significant. Like, for example, if you're showing one month difference, okay, you may be able to show by entering 10,000 patients. Uh, you may show statistical significance. But is it actually clinically meaningful? It may not be. So, that is where the statistical significance differs from clinical significance. You may be able to prove statistical significance by enrolling a very high number of, uh, large number of patients, okay, on a trial. But the difference may not be clinically important, okay? So, once again, I've just reiterated the hypothesis here. So, superiority, the null hypothesis, no difference. And then the uh, research hypothesis, there is difference. Now, the next question is, what are the factors that influence the sample size of the superiority trial? Okay. Now, uh, see, all of us should understand that it is unethical and unscientific to conduct underpowered studies. So, you should power your study adequately. So, all of us know what the, uh, what is the uh, need, uh, requirement uh, to calculate sample size. So, you, need, you should have know the alpha error, that is the type 1 error. You should know the beta error, that is, uh, you know, which indirectly reflects on the power of the study. Okay. Uh, so, and you should know the uh, actual uh, outcome uh, outcomes in in the standard arm. Okay, let's say a response rate of sixty percent, and you must uh, know what difference between the standard arm and the uh, the new treatment is clinically meaningful. Like if the new treatment takes the response rate from sixty percent to eighty percent, that may be clinically meaningful for you. So these four out in, inputs are necessary to calculate the sample size. Right? But in, a, in a looking at the statistical sense. So the uh, the variance, uh, okay. So variance is kind of a uh, dispersion in the data. Like for example, even in control arm, if you say that you know twelve months is the uh, sixty percent is the survival uh, is a response rate for any in the control intervention, that sixty percent is the average response rate. So it may range from thirty percent all the way to ninety percent or hundred percent. So then that variance, uh, you know, the variance is a measure of that dispersion. That variance confidence interval is always derived from your alpha error, whatever you choose. Okay, there's a type one error. Power is obtained from the beta error and the effect size. That is the difference that you are looking between the two treatments. So essentially, those are the inputs that go into the calculation of the sample size. And the sample size uh, equations are slightly different if it is a continuous variable. Okay, like different if you're looking at difference in height or difference in weight between the two between two intervention groups that is the continuous outcome variable or if you look at uh, looking at a binary outcome like response rate so the sample size uh, equation that you use are slightly different but essentially these are the four inputs that you'll have to give to calculate the sample size so when you go to a statistician next time to calculate the sample size you must be aware what is the alpha error what is the beta error uh, what is the alpha error you want what is the beta error you want what is the variance? What is the effect size? And so on. Okay. Now, so let us go to hypothesis uh, testing. So in a trial of good quality, the degree of statistical significance indicates the probability that the observed difference, okay, could have arisen by chance, assuming that no difference really existed. So what does it mean? When you say about alpha error, so when you say that an alpha error of 0.05 or 5% is acceptable to me, what do you mean to say, what you're actually meaning is, I am willing to accept a 5% chance of a false positive error. So which means there is actually no difference between the two treatment, but I'm concluding that there is a difference between the treatment. Okay. So in, in actuality, A is equal to B. But but we are in the trial, we're concluding that B is greater than A or B is better than A. So to make that conclusion, so there is always error. No, I mean, it's in, in uh, when you do any trials, no, I mean, it's not as though every time you do, you'll get the same results. Okay. So there is a matter of chance. 
So therefore, if you find a difference, people might say that this difference might be by chance. So therefore, you have to show them that, okay, I mean, this may be different, uh, you know, by chance, but the chance is not more than 5%. Because that is what I had powered the study for. I had said at the beginning that I will accept a false positive result of up to 5%, uh, you know, but not more than that. Okay. So, so what happens is the smaller this probability, the more implausible is the assumption that the really there is no difference. So what does it mean? Is if this alpha becomes very, very small, like, you know, uh, 1% or uh, uh, less than 1% or whatever, okay? Or if the p-value is like 0 0.00001, okay? So that's what it is. So if the probability p is equal to less than 0 0.00001, if you end up with that, it, be, it is very unlikely, unlikely that there is no difference. So the smaller the p-value, the higher the likelihood that that difference is actually true. Okay. So the chances of a, a false positive outcome is very, very, very less. Okay. So it then becomes important to estimate the size of the difference. So then you know that, you know, the difference is significant. Then what is the size of the difference that will be given by the confidence interval? Okay. So I'll just give you an example. So you, uh, so when you say confidence interval, you have a point estimate and a confidence interval. I'll just give you an example. Like, for example, this is a superiority trial. Okay. So this trial has uh, uh, shown superiority. This trial has not shown superiority. Why? This trial has shown superiority because the lower bound of the confidence interval is still, uh, you know, uh, more than zero. So therefore, it is saying that the new agent is better. This trial is not uh, superior because the lower bound of the confidence interval is crossing zero, which means that so this is a confidence interval. Now, what is the confidence? A ninety-five percent confidence interval. Ninety-five percent confidence interval says that if I repeat the same experiment or the same study hundred times, ninety-five percent of the time the results are going to fall in this range. So now, what you have said is, I am willing to accept a five percent chance of the false positive. Okay. So which means the remaining ninety-five percent of times it should fall in this range. So in the 95% uh, times, if the experiment, 100 times if the experiment is repeated, if 95 times it is falling within the, this range, I am willing to accept the result as superior. But here what is happening is, when I am in the second example, when I am uh, repeating the experiment 100 times, 95% of times it is falling in this range. And some of them are, uh, those, those results are going to indicate that the control is better than new treatment. So therefore, this will not be statistically significant. And truly enough, you are getting a p-value of 0.2. So most journals will, will uh, you know, will show only the, uh, most authors will prefer to show only the p-value. Okay, that will tell you whether there is significant difference or not. Okay, p less than 0 0.05 is significant, p more than 0 0.05 is not significant. But the importance of showing the confidence interval is that it will also help the reader to understand what is the magnitude of the effect. Okay, what is the magnitude of the effect and what is the confidence around that uh, point estimate? Okay, so therefore, it is always a good idea to show both the p value as well as the confidence interval because the reader will get to understand what exactly is the magnitude of the effect. Okay, so that is about uh, uh, superiority trials. So I'll just come to the next set of trials which are non-inferiority and equivalence. Here, what is happening is the competing intervention may not significantly differ in terms of their efficacy. So the efficacy wise, both may be same, but there may be some secondary advantages with the uh, competing intervention. Like it may be cheaper or it may be safer or it may be easy to understand, uh, administer like oral versus IV, you know, so on and so forth. So under these conditions, you will design what are known as equivalence and non-inferiority trials. So now coming to equivalence trials, equivalence trials are conducted to determine that efficacy of two drugs or interventions are by no, uh, differ by no, no more than a specific amount. So you have a center line, there is a line of no difference. And then equivalence trial says that the new treatment can be slightly worse or slightly better, but in either directions, it does not cross 
a certain margin. It will not be either grossly worse or it will it won't be grossly better. It will be worse or better within a certain margin. So that is called the equivalence trap. In practice, the word equivalence cannot be. So equivalence does not mean equal. So it does not mean that they, uh, they are equal. It only means that there may be difference, but the difference is not clinically important. Okay. So it can be said that the new treatment cannot be considered either better or worse than the standard. That's what it means. It doesn't say that, you know, it is equal. It only says that the new treatment is neither better nor worse compared to the standard treatment. Okay. So null hypothesis, once again, revisiting null hypothesis, A is not equal to B is the null hypothesis and you will reject that and accept the research hypothesis that A is equal to B. Okay. And how do you choose delta here? See, delta <coughs> there was in the superior trial, what is the minimum difference that is clinically meaningful? Here, the delta is what is the maximum difference that is clinically acceptable? Like, for example, once again, coming back to the, uh, 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 you know, example of uh, response rate. Suppose the response rate in my control arm is 60%. You will say that if the response rate is as low as 50% or as high as 70%, I am willing to consider that the new treatment is equivalent to the old treatment. Okay, so what you are trying is that is a maximum difference I am willing to accept because if it is less than 50%, it means that, you know, I am not willing to accept that, you know, the uh, new intervention is, uh, is equal. Okay, so therefore, only thing is in the equivalent trials, you have both a positive mar mar margin on the right hand side and margin on the left hand side. So margin for better and margin for worse. And then you are going to show that the difference is actually within that margin. So I'll, I'll just explain the next uh, few slides. Okay. So the maximum clinically acceptable difference that one is willing to uh, trade off for the secondary benefit of new treatment. Okay. So what are the benefits of uh, equivalence trial? It is useful in confirming the absence of a clinically meaningful difference between the groups. That is very obvious. And the extrapolation of findings to other indications of correct treatment. So when you demonstrate equivalence, no? So like, for example, let's say there's a drug which is used in more than one indication. Like, for example, you have rituximab, which is used for B-cell uh, lymphomas, which is also used for rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. So now the question is, do you want to, uh, if there is a biosimilar of rituximab, let us say, biosimilar of uh, rituximab, do you want to demonstrate equivalence both for rheumatoid arthritis and uh, uh, this one, uh, uh, BNHL? Or you just demonstrate in one of them and then assume that, you know, uh, if it is equivalent here, it is likely to be equivalent there also. So that flexibility it will have. So you can just demonstrate equivalence in one uh, one indication. And then, you know, it may be presumed that, you know, for the other indication also, it is likely to be equivalent. So, but what are the limitations? So changing standards of care may make a demonstration of equivalence uh, irrelevant. Like, for example, today you have demonstrated that, you know, uh, treatment B is equal to treatment A. Okay, equivalent equivalent to treatment A. But tomorrow, if the equal, uh, the treatment A is no longer a standard of care and the, the, uh, something else replaces treatment A as a standard of care, then what will happen to this treatment? Okay, so that is one problem or limitation that, you know, the, uh, because then you cannot uh, you, you will not be able to make any assumptions as to uh, how treatment B will perform against the new standard of care. Okay. And there's one more phenomenon called biocrypt, which all of us should be uh, careful about. So what happens is sometimes, you know, you have demonstrated equivalence of A and B. Okay. B is a new intervention. A is the old intervention. You have demonstrated that B is equivalent to A. Now there is a Another uh, uh, drug which comes later on called C. Now, what happens is, if you do equivalence trials of B and C, okay, so you may demonstrate that C is equivalent to B. Now, there may be a, a new treatment D coming, and when you do a demonstrated equivalence of D with C, and conclude that D is equivalent to C. And like the, you go, go on up to J, let us say. So, finally, if you uh, go on demonstrating equivalence with just a preceding uh, treatment, 
then finally when you have the jth drug or whatever it may actually be very very inferior to a okay so that phenomena is called biocrypt because you are demonstrating equivalence for successive uh, agents the agent that comes towards the end may not be actually equivalent to the uh, with the actual standard of care so that is called as a biocrypt and you should be very careful about that so therefore it is always better to demonstrate equivalence with what is what is the accepted standard, which is A. So every time a new treatment comes, you compare it with A rather than the preceding uh, drug, which has proved to be equivalent. Okay. So now, if we I have to discuss the step by step methods for designing equivalence trial, I'm just taking uh, three examples. I'll, I'll just give you three examples. So non opioid versus opioid analgesics after hospital discharge following cesarean uh, delivery. A randomized equivalence trial. So this study was comparing non-opioids versus opioids post uh, cesarean uh, delivery. Okay. So and then what is the hypothesis? I'll come later. So the next study is long-term primary results of accelerated partial breast irradiation after breast conservation surgery for early stage breast cancer. So then uh, this one is uh, is comparing accelerated partial breast irradiation with uh, the conventional way of breast irradiation. And the third example is effect of infusion set replacement intervals on catheter related bloodstream infection. Okay. So if I replace the center, uh, you know, the catheter maybe in five days versus 10 days, are the outcomes going to be inferior in terms of bloodstream infection? Okay. Catheter related bloodstream infection. That is the hypothesis. Okay. And interestingly, here there are two hypotheses that they are testing. Okay. So they are testing in the same trial. They are testing uh, the central venous access devices for equivalence, and they are testing the peripheral arterial catheters for non-inferiority. So this is a very unique. So the, see that is the flexibility that these parallel designs will give you. So you can have multiple hypotheses in the same, okay, and you can test them. I'll just uh, you know uh, come to that in a in a bit, okay. So selection of control arm. How will you select a control arm uh, for the equivalence trial? There should be evidence showing the superiority of the active control over earlier standard of care. So, whichever is the current standard of care, which has demonstrated superiority over earlier standards of care or placebo of the case may be, that should be chosen. Whichever is the current standard, that should be chosen as the standard of care. And the dose and dosage regimen of the current standard should be actually, uh, the, the correct dose and dosage regimen should be used. Like, for example, if uh, uh, something like, uh, you know, uh, this platin is used at uh, 100 mg per meter square in certain indication, which is standard. So even when you're demonstrating equivalence of, uh, you know, when you're doing an equivalence tree, you should do the same dose of this platin in the other as a control arm. You cannot uh, take a lower dose. Of, okay, I'll take only 50 uh, mg per meter square and demonstrate equivalence because that is not the standard. So whatever was the standard, you should take that as the control at the right dose and regimen. Regimen is for how long you are you're going to give and so on. Okay. So now margin selection in an equivalence trial. So I told you that the margin is the maximum accepted difference. Okay. On either side. It could be inferior or it could be uh, better. Uh, it could be better or worse. But what is the maximum difference that is clinically acceptable? That will be the margin. It will be represented as delta. Okay. Now you should be very careful in in uh, selecting the margin. If you uh, select too narrow a margin, okay. So like for example, the response rate of sixty percent is the uh, control arm. You are uh, you you want to demonstrate equivalence between fifty eight to sixty two percent. That is a very narrow margin. So then the chances that you will fail to demonstrate equivalence is very high. On the other hand, if you, okay, uh, I want to demonstrate equivalence at any cost, so let me uh, keep the uh, uh, margin high. So you, so for a 60% response rate in the standard arm, you will make the margin plus or minus 30%. So that means from 30% to 90% is acceptable. So then what happens is you may demonstrate equivalence, but that becomes irrelevant, inconsequential, because that is not clinically acceptable. I mean, in the sense, if, uh, if a new drug is causing a response rate of 30% of the against 60% uh, of standard, Obviously, it won't be acceptable. So, therefore, that selection of margin should you should give a lot of thought into what is clinically meaningful. Okay. So now we have those uh, three trials here, and we'll discuss the step-by-step -step approach. So, one is about 
non opioids versus opioids for uh, analgesia post cesarean the other one is partial breast irradiation versus whole breast irradiation okay uh, for early breast cancer and the third one is uh, the du duration of uh, catheter replacement uh, you know both peripheral as well as central so what is the duration uh, maybe 5 days versus 10 days whatever I will just uh, uh, come to know about that okay so now here when it comes to statistics for equivalence trial because equivalence will have two margins one on the right side and one on the left side you will use what is called as a two one-sided test okay so you will have to demonstrate that you know the on the right hand side also the difference is not significant on the left hand side also the difference is not significant so therefore you are going to use what is called as a two one-sided test and typical values of alpha are uh, 0 0.025 for a 95% confidence interval. So why 0 0.025? Because you are going to use 0 0.025, uh, that is 2.5% on the right hand side and 2.5% on the left hand side. So together you are uh, spending about 5% of alpha. So that will give you 95% confidence interval. Okay. So this, this, this is something you should remember when you are doing equivalence trial, whatever is the total alpha that you want. Okay. Let's say you want to demonstrate uh, uh, the uh, do the clinical trial at a 5% alpha. That 5% will be split equally for the two one-sided test. So you'll have 2.5% uh, for the right side analysis and 2.5% for the left side analysis. Okay. So equivalence is established if the outer bounds of the confidence interval is within the equivalence region that all of us understand. Two one-sided uh, tests will give two p-values because you are comparing the outcome with reference to the right side margin. You are comparing the outcome with reference to the left side margin. So you'll get two p-values. Okay. So if the larger of the p-values, like for example, one p-value is 0 0.02. The second p-value is 0 0.03. And the p-value that you have agreed upon is 0 0.025. So what has happened is the larger of the p-value is more than the P that you set. So larger of the P values will be like, or the alpha. So you set an alpha 0 0.025. One alpha, uh, one P value is 0 0.02. The other P value is 0 0.03. The larger P value should be less than alpha to conclude that it is equivalent. If the larger P value is more than alpha, then you say that equivalence uh, uh, hypothesis is uh, not founded. Okay. So, I mean, with the help of uh, uh, graphics, we'll be able to understand better. I'll just come to that. So, now, whenever you're doing equivalence trials, see, we have all heard about intention to treat population and per protocol pop, uh, pop analysis. So, intention to treat analysis is you will analyze as randomized. Like, for example, if uh, one set of people have got A, the other set of people have got B, you will not whether uh, mind whether, you know, there was some uh, uh, mistake during... Uh, uh, treatment, uh, giving treatment, and uh, you know this person who should have got A uh, got B, or uh, the whether the patient could complete the treatment properly. So all or there were lost to follow. You don't worry about that. Okay, that is called as intentional treat analysis, which is as randomized. Per protocol analysis is when you analyze only those patients who have completed all the trial related activities. Now, what is the difference between intention to treat analysis and per protocol? Intention to treat analysis is a more of a real world situation okay so it is a very conservative uh, tool uh, a can conservative analytical technique that tends to show that there is no difference between the two treatment okay so intention treatment analysis is a conservative uh, analytical method which tends to show that there is no significant difference between the two treatment so because it is conservative it favors your equivalence hypothesis because even in equivalence, you are trying to show that, you know, there is no major difference between the two treatments. Okay. So then what happens is sometimes you may end up with a false positive conclusion that treatment B is equal to treatment A. But actually there may be a difference. So therefore, we use a less conservative approach which tends to show that there is difference. And that is the per protocol analysis. And in the per protocol analysis also, if you are still able to demonstrate equivalence, then you can be very sure that treatment B is equivalent to treatment A. So, so a point to remember here is for superiority trial, you will always use intensity to treat analysis. But for an equivalence trial, you are better off 
supplementing the intention to treat analysis with a per protocol analysis, which means supplementing the analysis of those as randomized with, with analysis of only those individuals who completed the full study properly. Okay. So now I'll just, uh, uh, we'll uh, work out the various uh, stages, uh, steps of uh, this equivalent study. Okay. I'll just take one example in the interest of time. So maybe let us take the example of uh, uh, this uh, breast irradiation. Okay. So recognize the problem under the first question. Yes, we have recognized the problem. Long duration of adjuvant whole breast irradiation after uh, lumpectomy. So that is the um, problem. Like you have to uh, do a long duration of treatment. Okay. Which brings us to the control arm. That is whole breast irradiation. The choice of the intervention is I have an accelerated partial breast irradiation which is faster. Okay, maybe it will bring down the duration of time for which the patient is exposed to radiation, or whatever, whatever. There is some advantage. So let's see what the second advantage is. Accelerated partial breast irradiation, otherwise called as APBI, to only the tumor bearing quadrant can shorten treatment duration. So, and with shortening tumor uh, treatment duration, there are several advantages, like, you know, your OPD cost will decrease, your OPD, uh, whatever, you know, machine time will uh, uh, come down, so you can uh, irradiate more number of people. There are so many advantages of, uh, you know, uh, shortening the duration of treatment. So, now then you have chosen a margin, uh, a relative risk of 0.67 to 1.5. So you might wonder why is this uh, relative risk little uneven, like 0. 0.67 to 1. So ideally, you would, you would say uh, 0.5 to 1.5. So with the one being the line of no difference, uh, you know, or uh, you know unity, okay, uh, with uh, the uh, there is no difference in the treatment, you would expect the relative risk to range from the margin to range from 0.5 to 1.5. But here we are saying it is 0. 0.67 to 1.5. That is because here we are looking at a ratio. So the ratio, uh, the way it works is, if one is the line of no difference, one upon 0.65 is what? Is equal to 1.5. Likewise, 1 1.5 upon one is what? 1.5. So therefore the ratio is maintained. So that is the case for all outcome measures which have the ratio. It could be odds ratio, it could be hazard ratio, it could be relative uh, you know, risk ratio or whatever. But on the other hand, if you're looking at differences, okay, not the ratio, but difference, okay, then it's something like this, minus 10 to plus 10. With zero as the line of no difference, you have minus 10 to plus 10. With zero as the line of uh, no uh, difference, okay, plus 2% to minus 2%. So that, that, is, uh, that is how, uh, you know, the margins are selected. For, uh, for ratios, it is always that the line of no difference divided by the uh, lower end of the uh, margin should be equal to higher end of the margin divided by line of no difference. So that line of no difference will act as the geometrical mean. So these are all the arithmetic means on the other two sides. But here it acts as the geometrical mean. Okay. And here you will see that, you know, most of the people have used an intention to treat analysis as well as the per protocol analysis. In fact, for all the three examples, they have used both intention to treat analysis as well as um uh, uh per protocol analysis and the relative risk in the in the case of uh, this study is ipsilateral breast, uh, breast uh, ibtr ibtr is the ipsilateral breast uh, cancer of uh, breast tumor recurrence okay so now uh, so what is the uh, relative risk of ipsilateral breast tumor of uh, recurrence this is what is being investigated so now what is happening is uh, in the first example i mean let us uh, Okay, uh, let us forget the, uh, we'll concentrate only on the second and third example because that is more important. So what is happening is, I told you that this is uh, the line of unity, which means there is no difference. This is a lower bound of the margin, okay? And this is the upper bound. So this is at 0.67, this is at 1.5. And I told you that one upon 0.67 is the same as 1.5 upon one, and that is how you select the margin. And then uh, this is important, favors whole bre uh, breast irradiation, that is the control arm. This is favors uh, accelerated partial breast irradiation. And what you found is that this outcome is actually favoring the whole breast irradiation. And, and the outer bound is actually breaching this uh, uh, margin of 1.5. Okay. 
so the outer bound of this confidence interval is actually straddling this margin of, uh, of 1.5 so therefore you can conclude that the accelerated partial brush irradiation is not equivalent to whole brush irradiation because this the whole brush uh, the whole brush irradiation the the risk of ipsilateral brush tumor recurrence is less as compared to partial brush accelerated partial brush irradiation so this is how you test a non equivalence hypothesis uh, suppose if this outer bound were to come here within this margin then you could have easily concluded uh, equivalence and these two lines are only there because we are doing it both by per protocol as well as the intention to treat analysis so the, the lower one is the intention to treat analysis and the upper one is the per protocol analysis and uh, you will also be is also interesting to note that the margin of the uh, intention to treat analysis is more towards one see in the two groups okay the mar the outer bound of the intention to treat analysis is more towards one as compared to the per protocol analysis that is always because intention to treat analysis is more conservative that is the reason why you should also use the per protocol analysis for equivalence studies now in the next example I mean, i'll just tell you uh, this is important so per protocol analysis uh, modified uh, intention to treat analysis for central venous arterial device okay and what happened is okay so this was the comparison between seven day versus four day so the convention was four day okay and the uh, no convention was seven day so you thought that you know you can reduce the uh, no no i'm sorry i'm sorry one second no. okay okay so the conventional is the uh, um, four day infusion set replacement and you want to show that even if you replace it at the end of seven days it is okay okay so therefore the uh, the new treatment is the seven day infusion set replacement and we are looking for central venous arterial device and see look at the danger here when you do an intention to treat analysis what is happening it is sitting within the equivalence margin why this point estimate and the confidence interval are within these margins you are able to see but when you did a per protocol analysis you will realize that it is kind of breaching the outer bound okay so this once again underscores the need why when you are demonstrating equivalence you should do both intention to treat analysis as well as per protocol because intention to treat analysis is always conservative it tends to show that there is no difference but in an equivalence study the hypothesis there is the null hypothesis there is a difference so if you have to support the null hypothesis you need a per protocol analysis and in spite of the per protocol analysis if uh, the outcomes are uh, kind of within the margin then you will accept it as truly uh, significant so just to give you an example for the peripheral arterial uh, this one uh, catheter okay what is happening is the uh, the margins are within the equivalence range both for modify more both by modified intention to treat analysis as well as per protocol analysis but here for central venous you could have made a mistake you would have made a mistake if you have only resorted to intention to treat without doing the per protocol analysis okay okay so that's about equivalence uh, studies so i think uh, i hope you understood the significance of the margin the significance of this the significance of line of no difference the significance of, uh, of uh, per protocol analysis so these are some of the uh, and why you know uh, in in uh, when you are taking uh, uh, risk uh, uh, ratios like uh, relative risk or odds ratio or hazard ratio or whatever the margins are not going to be uh, same on, on either side i hope you understood that as well so these are some of the salient things that you must understand when you are dealing with equivalence trials now that will bring us to the next section which is non inferiority trials okay non inferiority trials aim to demonstrate that an experimental treatment or procedure is not worse okay than a standard procedure okay here because by the definition itself you know that there is only one margin you are only interested in showing that it is not worse okay you are not worried if it is too much better but you are only you know concerned with showing that it is not worse these trials are conducted when some modest uh, reduction in efficacy may be acceptable 
So you're willing to accept modest, modest uh, reduction in efficacy as a trade-off for certain benefit, uh, secondary benefits like cost, safety, ease of administration, and so on. Unlike equal trials, NA do not require two margins. So there are only, there's only one margin. But, but here, there's one very interesting, uh, this one in uh, uh, non-infrared trials about margin, whether it should be uh, minus delta or plus delta. I'll give you an example. Like, for example, uh, once again, we'll come back to re uh, response rates. Response rate is 50% in control. I am willing to accept a 10% up to 10% margin. I know it can be 10% worse, not beyond. Okay, so which means you are willing to accept up to 60%. No, no sorry, up to 40%. Why? 50% is your response rate with the controller. So you want to demonstrate the non inferiority of the new intervention. You are saying that I am willing to accept even if the new treatment is providing responses as less as 40%. But less than 40%, I cannot accept. So there the margin is what? Minus 10. Okay. From 50, it has come down to 40. So that is minus 10. But on the other hand, if I'm doing an antibiotic study, and then I say that the incidence of breakthrough infections with the one treatment is 20%. Okay. So I have a new intervention. Okay. I am willing to accept incidence of breakthrough infection up to 25%. So here what is happening is here we are talking about failure. See, a breakthrough infection is a failure of treatment. So then in the, those cases, the margin will be more than the control. Okay. So if the um, if the control is 20%, the uh, the worst you will tolerate with the new treatment is higher, 25%. But in the case of response rate, the worst you will tolerate is lower than the response. So what it means is, if the outcome of interest is measured by success rate, as in a response rate, okay, higher values are always better. Like 50 is better than 40. But if the outcome of interest is measured by failure rate, the, let's say breakthrough infection, that is a failure failure rate, then lower values are always better. So which means 20% is better than 25% here. Okay. So the margin is set accordingly as either minus delta or plus delta. Did you understand? So that is that is all I uh, you know I wanted to make you understand here. So benefits of uh, and limitations of non impurity helps to compare an intervention which has secondary benefits. That is fine. In circumstances where assigning patients to a placebo is unethical, like for example, you have a new treatment, and whenever you uh, demonstrate, uh, uh, you know, uh, you want to de demonstrate a new treatment is good. Okay, so one of the accepted methods is placebo control trial. Okay, so but placebo control trials may be unethical to do because there's always already a standard of care. So now you want to compare this with the standard of care. Now the problem is you are not sure that your new treatment will be significantly better than the standard of care. If you were confident about that, you would have resorted to, to, to a superiority design. But you are not confident. But at the same time, you uh, believe that the new treatment has certain advantages, like it is less toxic or whatever. So then what you do is you do a non inferiority trial with, uh, you know, uh, using the existing uh, standard of care as the control. Okay. So beneficial when the surrogate endpoint is to be studied rather than a clinical endpoint in a, in a trial. So, I mean, this uh, this is okay. I mean, this may or may not be a huge benefit because there are still a lot of uh, uh, non infinity trials which are conducted uh, for survival outcomes. But but the purpose of doing a non infinity trial is that, you know, you want to bring the uh, treatment into uh, clinical use as quickly as possible. So, therefore, you know, if there is a robust surrogate endpoint, surrogate endpoints by definition always happen much before the clinical endpoints of interest. So if you have a um, surrogate endpoint, then you'll be able to demonstrate non-inferiority quickly. So that is that is what it means. And then you need to have a clinical equipoise. So there should be genuine uncertainty as to which is better. Okay. So only then you can do a non-inferiority trial. So if you look at the hypothesis of a non-inferiority trial, what is the null hypothesis? The 
new treatment is inferior and the research hypothesis is the new treatment is not inferior so uh, so that uh, that state where you assume that the new treatment is not inferior is called as the clinical equipoise okay because if you if you feel that the new treatment is going to be inferior then you will not be doing a non inferiority trial so therefore having that clinical equipoise is necessary having uh, some reason or rational to believe that the new treatment is going to be comparable with the standard of care is very important and that state of comparableness that you uh, assume is called as clinical equipoise and biocreep once again the same as uh, equivalence so when you demonstrate non inferiority of successful treatment it is better that you always do it against uh, the original standard of care rather than the uh, new treatment that are shown to be uh, non non inferiority non inferior if the effect of uh, so the one more thing is if the effect of standard treatment is very close to placebo like for example placebo uh, has certain outcomes and the standard of care is marginally better than uh, placebo but still it is uh, approved okay and in those circumstances if you demonstrate non inferiority of uh, new treatment with respect to the standard of care you must uh, be careful you must be wary that it may not be better than placebo also why because in the first place the difference between standard of care and placebo itself was not very big and now you are demonstrating non inferiority of the new treatment with respect to standard of care so you must be uh, wary that the no, the new treatments may not be better than placebo okay so there are some examples uh, so one example is like doing a, a, a covid uh, vaccination study and uh, showing non inferiority that you know you can vaccinate an in, a cancer patient no matter what treatment he is getting okay so uh, the mrna covid vaccine in vaccination in patients receiving chemotherapy immunotherapy or chemotherapy for solid tumor a prospective multicentric non inferiority trial so i'll just explain that in the next one so the second example is discontinuing beta lactam antibiotics uh, after 3 days for patients with community acquired pneumonia in non critical care ward a double blind so maybe the current standard is 5 days you want to discontinue treatment after 3 days as, as a new uh, new intervention so once again you know you are exposing the uh, the patient less to antibiotics and the toxicities and you are reducing the cost and so on and so forth you want to show that you know 3 day treatment is as good as 5 day treatment or the final example is hyperfractionated versus conventional fractionated post mastectomy radiotherapy for patients with high risk breast, uh, breast cancer so whether you can give uh, you can consider these patients for hyperfractionated because you know once again the duration of treatment uh, will be less okay compared to conventional treatment so these are the three uh, examples so now margin selection so in equivalence study when we discussed about margin selection we said that the margin should be set such that it is not too uh, less uh, that you know you are not able to demonstrate equivalence or should not be too wide that you know the demonstration of equivalence is meaningless but here uh, in non inferiority there is a more uh, scientific way of calculating the margins okay so the scientific way of calculating the margins is that you have let us say okay i'll just uh, uh, let us say the standard of care which had demonstrated superiority over placebo some time ago okay then you have that difference of standard care with respect to placebo okay and then when you want to calculate the margin for this new treatment versus uh, standard of care for non inferiority the margin you are going to set is like look the standard care is 50 unit points better than the placebo okay the 50 units could be anything uh, you know uh, it could be uh, you know uh, survival rate So an overall survival or uh, or recurrence rate survival or response rate or uh, uh, you know pain or whatever. And so let us say it is fifty unit points better than placebo. Now how do you calculate the margin of an non-clinical trial? You will say that out of those fifty units, with the new treatment that I am introducing in the non-clinical uh, trial, I want to retain at least eighty percent of that effect. Okay. if i am not able to get 80% of the effect then i won't be happy so then 80% of 50 units is what 
40. So what it means is your standard of care uh, is better than placebo by 50 units. But I want to retain at least 80% of that effect, which is 40 units. So therefore, I will settle for a margin of 10 units between the new treatment and the old treatment. So that 10 units will become the margin. I'll just uh, uh, explain that with the help of an example. Like, for example, this is called as uh, uh, M1. Okay. So, this is the old treatment standard of care. It is, it has proven to be superior to placebo. And the difference between the lower bound and the zero is about this much, which is called as M1. Now, what you are going to say is, I want to retain certain fraction of this M1. Okay. In this example, we have said that I want to retain 70% of M1 to be preserved. So therefore, this is the preserved fraction. So you want to preserve this effect, never ever, no matter what happens, you want to preserve this effect. So what is left for the margin is this much. So this will be the M2, which is the actual margin for your non inferiority trial. I hope you understood now. It is very simple. So this is the margin, uh, this is the effect that the, the treatment had over the placebo. And out of this effect, you say that I want to retain this, this much at least, okay? If I cannot retain this much, I'm not happy. So therefore, this minus this will become your margin for non-inferiority trial, M2, okay? So I think this is uh, not very important. Statistical analysis, but can the lower uh, Okay, so now, uh, so basically, the confidence interval that you calculate is given by 100 into 1 minus 2 alpha. So, like generally, because it is a one sided hypothesis, you will take the uh, alpha to be 0 0.025 or 2.5 percent. 0 0.025 or 2.5% if you want to calculate the uh, the outcomes at 95% confidence interval. So the confidence interval is given by 100 minus 1 minus 2 alpha. So if your alpha is 0 0.025, 2 into 0 0.025 is 0 0.05, 1 minus uh, 0 0.05 is 95. So this will give you the 95% confidence interval. Okay. And the delta of positive uh, minus delta or plus delta is based on what is the nature of the outcome. If the outcome is a positive outcome, like a response rate or whatever, then higher numbers are better. Okay. If the outcome is a, a negative outcome, like a, a recurrence or something like that, then lower values are better. So according to that, the delta will be either a plus uh, uh, delta or it will be a minus delta. For, for positive outcomes, the delta will be minus delta. For negative outcomes, the delta will be plus delta. And that we have discussed earlier also. Okay. And the most important thing you must understand for non inferior trial is the margin will be on the side of the control arm. I'll just show you with the help of an example. Uh, okay. I'll come to that later. But just remember this the margin should always be on the side of the control arm. Okay. So once again, uh, you know, uh, two types of analysis are possible. You have uh, uh, modified intervention to treat analysis or per protocol, both of them should be employed, okay, uh, for the same reasons as the equivalence trial, uh, because uh, intention to analysis is more conservative, so it may actually favor the hypothesis that there is no treatment difference, so therefore you must use an, an uh, you know, a slightly less conservative approach like per protocol also, okay, and um, when you are uh, doing uh, the, uh, the test, the statistical test, it is a one-sided test because the, the margin is only on one side, you're doing a one-sided test. And the size of the, um, uh, the sample size and the margin, there's a direct uh, correlation. So if the margin is wide, like for example, if you are accepting, uh, so let's say hazard, okay? So hazard ratio of 1.3, if you put the margin at 1.3, then you will have a sample size of X. If you put the margin at 1.5, which means you are willing to uh, accept a, a, a higher hazard ratio, 
then your sample size will reduce dramatically. I think this can be explained much better in, in the, the example of the pain score. Let's say in the pain score, you are willing to accept a 10 point difference in pain as a margin, then your sample size will be X. But if you say no, 10, not 10, I can even uh, you know accept a margin which is up to 15 point uh, difference. So then because the delta has increased, your sample size will reduce dramatically. Okay, so there is an inverse relationship between the sample size and the and the delta that you choose. Okay, so now with the uh, so the uh, three studies uh, we looked at now one is the, the immunogenicity of COVID vaccine and the other one is the duration of treatment with beta lactam antibiotics and the third one is hyperfractionation versus uh, uh, conventional uh, radiotherapy. Okay, so here what is the selection of the control arm? Always remember. In a non infected trial, the selection of control arm is important. So, vaccination in individuals without cancer. So, you want to see what is the breakthrough uh, COVID uh, infections in patients without cancer, and then use that as a basis to say whether you know if the patients is uh, patients are getting chemotherapy or radiotherapy or uh, immunotherapy or whatever, whether the breakthroughs will increase or it will not increase. Okay, here once again, there is only one hypothesis increase you, because you don't expect the breakthroughs to be less in cancer patients anyway. So, you only expect the breakthroughs to be higher, but not so much higher that you know it, it becomes uh, inferior. So, that, that is the hypothesis. Okay, so once again, here three day treatment were, uh, versus Friday treatment, uh, whether uh, so five days standard, three days were experimental, and in the in this case. Five week schedule of conventional fractionated radiotherapy will be your standard, and your hyperfractionated radiotherapy, which is three weeks, will be your intervention. Okay, so margin selection once again, depending on the outcome, it will be uh, the margin will be chosen. Like, for example, you can uh, see here, okay, uh, you have chosen hazard ratio, uh, uh, you know, for, to set the margin, but uh, in other places, you are choosing percentages to set the margin. That depends on the outcome of interest, like, for example. Uh, here, uh, you know, percentage points. That is because how many per, uh, percentage of patients are going to, uh, you know, have failure at treatment. So that is percentage. Here, once again, you know, what percentage of patients will develop breakthrough COVID infection? But here, what is the hazard of developing uh, a, a recurrence or whatever? Okay. So the hazard of recurrence. So therefore, you can use hazard ratio as the margin. So 1.883 is a very huge hazard ratio. So, which means that you know it will reduce the size dramatically. Okay, and uh, you should always understand that you know uh, uh, intention to treat as well as per protocol are the both are the methods of choice. And alpha is typically 0 0.025 because uh, it should be typically 0 0.025 if you are looking at 95% confidence interval. If you keep the alpha at 5 percent, uh, then you are actually looking at a 90% confidence interval. Okay. So now these are the outcomes. And what it showed is no matter whether the patient is, uh, you know, getting immunotherapy or chemotherapy or radiotherapy, the incidence of breakthrough infections is not worse than patients without cancer. So this, uh, this zero is the line corresponds to the difference between cancer patients and the patients without cancer. And you'll see that, you know, cohort 1D, I don't exactly remember what 1D, uh, you know, cohort B, uh, B, C, D uh, are. But one of them is radiotherapy, one of them is chemotherapy, and one of them is immunotherapy. And in all instances, they are within the margin. So you can conclude that giving COVID vaccine, that RNA COVID vaccine during cancer treatment will not cause any inferior outcomes, COVID outcomes, in terms of breakthrough uh, uh, infection uh, compared to patients who do not have cancer. Okay. Because the non infected hypothesis is met here. So there is these uh, cancer patients receiving vaccine are not inferior in terms of COVID outcome. Okay. And always observe that the margin is placed on the side of the control arm. Like A is control arm. A here is patients without cancer. So that is control and the margin is always on the side of the control. Here once again, see the example E, the margin the, uh, is on the side of the control. The control is five days of beta lactam antibiotics. The test is three days of beta lactam antibiotics. And here, once again, what you have seen is both the per protocol and intentional treatment analysis, the outcomes are within the margin. 
In fact, this is slightly opposite. In fact, the three days is showing to be better for whatever reason. Okay. But anyway, I mean, it is uh, straddling this uh, zero line. But what is more important here is the outer bound of this confidence interval is not breaching the margin. So therefore, you can say that three days is not inferior to five days. And uh, once again, in the in the radiotherapy experiment, because they had resorted only to intention to treat analysis, we don't have a per protocol graph here. And once again, you, you will see that the margin outer bound is less than the margin. The margin was a hazard of 1.8. What was that? 1.883. The hazard of 1.883, the hazard of 1.8 is a very huge hazard ratio. I mean, generally, I mean, it may not be advisable to set such high hazard ratios uh, for non integral trials. Okay. Because then sometimes it may become meaningless. See, actually what is happening is your outer bound is coming up to 1.6 or 1.7. You are demonstrating non-inferiority based on this hypothesis. But actually, what you will have to wonder is whether it is clinically meaningful. Because, because some of, uh, some patients, you know, um, the outer bound is 1.73 means there can be a 73% higher chance of uh, uh, recurrence, let us say, if you are uh, using hypofractionated treatment. Okay. But still, it, it is within the non infertility margin. So, hazard ratio of five year cumulative incidence of local regional recurrence for hypofractionated group versus the conventional group, it is meeting the non infertility criteria because it is within the margin. But once again, I feel that this margin was too wide. And uh, it makes me wonder whether, you know, I can actually kind of deliver hyperfractionation in, in, uh, like, uh, in the clinics because the outer bound is so away from uh, no difference. This is the line of no difference and the outer bound is too, so far away. That is because of the margin you set. You have set a very high margin. So that is something you should be very, very careful about. Just to make the sample size small, if you keep the margin very high, you may be successful in demonstrating non-inferiority, but it may not be clinically meaningful. Okay, so this is my last slide. Uh, uh, okay, so basically condition for application is comparing novel treatment with the old treatment in all the cases. Uh, control can be placebo in the superiority trial, but more often than not, there will be a standard uh, treatment for uh, equivalence and uh, non inferiority trials. Okay, hypothesis, there is a difference. There is a two-tailed hypothesis. non inferiority is always a one-tailed hypothesis. Equivalence is once again a two-tailed hypothesis. And then statistical significance is that uh, if the difference between the two treatment is not equal to zero, it means that one of them is superior to the other. Okay. Likewise, if the difference between two treatment is greater than certain margin. Uh, uh, so here is greater than minus delta means it is actually within the margin. Okay. So then it demonstrates non inferiority. Here, if the difference between the mean is less than delta, once again, the equivalence is true. So this is the operating hypothesis for superiority, non-inferiority, and equivalence trial. Superiority is always analyzed using intention to treat analysis, but you, you have to use, you are better off using both ITT as well as per protocol analysis for uh, non-inferiority trials. And uh, reporting is always uh, p-value uh, and preferably with confidence interval. But uh, for non-inferiority and uh, equivalence trial, you have to demonstrate confidence interval. See? In all the examples of non inferiority you know, you, you have the confidence interval statement. So that brings me to the end of my uh, talk. And uh, I, I understand that it has been a slightly longish talk. So if there are any questions, I'll be able to, I'll be happy to answer. Uh, so thank you. Uh, it was a, an excellent class. I think it was a very difficult topic and you made it easy. Uh, I think there is one question on the chat box. Before that, I just want to ask you one simple question. Like in our day-to-day -day routine, uh, when like as a surgical, uh, uh, as a surgeon, so we usually what we come across is whenever we want to plan a study, what happens is uh, that our numbers are limited because surgery per se, lot of implications. So what happens is suppose we want to do a study which includes complications. And we want to do some intervention and want to show, okay, there is some decrease in the complication rate. Okay. So what happens is in those cases, what should we, how should we go ahead and plan the study? Because number here is a problem. We can't have too many numbers and even the intervention takes a lot of time. Yeah, good question. So I uh, see, uh, see one thing is for sure. If you don't have that adequate power, 
then uh, you know uh, you will not be able to prove your point okay and it is unethical to do underpowered studies so if that is the case and you think that you are not able to meet the sample size requirements it, it, it may be a good idea to have a multicentric study so that you know you can meet the numbers that is one way of doing it otherwise you will end up doing some kind of a, a phase two trial which is at best you know hypothesis generating but you will never be able to provide confirmatory uh, evidence okay so if you want to do provide a confirmatory evidence it has to be powered for the sample size and uh, if you cannot do it as a single center the only other approach is to do it as a multicentric study and uh, of course you know you have to you select your you know difference between the two treatment in uh, you know um, uh, which is clinically meaningful just to reduce the sample size you cannot assume a huge difference because uh, then your study will fail okay so okay. i think the multicentric is... yeah. sorry sure. Sure. go ahead go yeah, multicentric is the option for uh, you know those kind of situations where you cannot enroll too many patients in a single center. Correct. So this is often a problem. That's why I was asking with us clearly that whenever we want to do a clinically relevant study where there will be a clinic, clinical meaningful difference, and the question is also relevant, usually this comes as the biggest uh, roadblock because the number is a problem. So I think multicentric is the way to go. So yeah, we do. And also, see, the other thing is, you know, uh, sometimes see the other best thing is you may uh, uh, do a study uh, with certain assumptions you know with a sample size which is kind of achievable and then uh, you show the confidence interval also in, in addition to the p value because p value by itself like p value of 0.2 or 0.3 doesn't tell give you all the information you show the confidence interval and uh, you know based on the confidence interval people may kind of make their opinion about you know how uh, yeah, you know uh, yeah uh, uh, how much weightage can be given to the outcomes and it is left to them whether they want to kind of adopt uh, the new approach as compared to the conventional approach based on the confidence interval that you are showing but in any case it I ultimately it boils down to uh, you know having sufficient power to do that plan so yeah multicentric is better so there is a question on the yeah sir. question in the chat box if you could take that uh, yeah, let me see. So, which one is more important, uh, p value or uh, ci? Why can't we report only ci and not p value? Any example? Okay, so uh, see, uh, I mean, there is nothing, uh, something is more important or something is less important because the confidence interval comes from p value. Like, if you have an alpha of uh, 5%, per, uh, 5 percent, then you will actually be, uh, you know, looking at 95 percent confidence interval because. Confidence interval is one minus alpha. Okay, but the only difference between p value and uh, uh, confidence interval is p value will tell you whether the difference is significant or not. But suppose your p value is uh, is, uh, is significant, like 0 0.03 or 0 0.02 or something like that. But that will give the reader no idea as to what was the magnitude of the effect. Okay. So that is why people uh, recommend that in addition to the p value, you also show the confidence interval so that you know where the line of no difference, you know where the point estimate is, you know where the interval is, and you know how the how far the lower margin of the interval is away from the uh, line of no difference. So that will give a more visual impact as to the actual effect of the new intervention. So therefore, I know the suggestion is that you please report both p value and confidence interval. And for non purity and equal trial, you cannot, uh, you cannot not report the confidence interval. You have to report because you know understanding whether they are falling within the margin or not is very important, and that depends on the confidence interval. So for NA and equal trials, you have to report the confidence interval. But for superiority trial, my suggestion is, in addition to the p value, you please report the confidence interval so that the person who is looking at it will get an idea as to. It is better, but how much better it is. So that is best shown with the help of confidence interval. Okay. So the second question is, we will be discussing uh, the no, question. Sir. The... <laughs> okay. Okay. Sir. Sir. okay sir. I think uh, if any other question, uh, we can take it. Sir, if there are no more questions, uh, then we can uh, conclude today's lecture.
so i thank you once again sir uh, it was a uh, excellent lecture and i think it was qu quite a difficult topic at least for us clinicians and you made it uh, quite easy for us to understand uh, that is my understanding <laughs> so if you want me to send you the uh, powerpoint i can share it with you so that you know you sir, can kind of we have recorded this lecture and oh, okay, if okay. you agree to that we will be putting it on our youtube also Perfect. So if you agree to that, so that will be available to other students also, and whenever they want to. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye.